Forget that. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our uh, Wednesday wellness webinar. Um, our topic tonight is feeding the broodmare. And we're super excited to have both um, Dr. Jody Santarosa from Delaney and Brittany Davis from Davis Equine Services. Sorry, I'm multitasking here. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Brittany to start. I'm, I'm going to cheat and, and go from her website here. Um, she's a lifelong uh, horse enthusiast, um, has done a range of disciplines from English, Western racing and polo, always been interested in health and welfare for animals. She completed her Master's of Science in Equine, Master of Science in Equine Science degree with merit from the University of Edinburgh, the Royal School of Veterinary Studies. And uh, in her downtime, she can be found spending time with her seven horses. Is it still only seven, Brittany? No. <laughs> well, the answer uh, to that. Seven slash eight, I do also um, get to ride my mums on occasion, so. Sweet, sweet. Um, she's also a, me a member of the American Academy for Veterinary Nutrition. So I think we can all agree that her background and knowledge on this topic is pretty extensive. Um, and I want to just quickly read a little excerpt from, I mean, you all know Dr. Santa Rosa because she's fabulous, but I thought uh, I grabbed this from her bio today because um, it just was, it resonated with the topic tonight. And I'm just going to quote her favorite um, quote from Hipp Hippocrates, mm -hmm. which is let the food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So with no further comment from me, I'm going to let you guys take over and um, enjoy everyone. <laughs> right, hello everyone and welcome. Um, so yeah, as Penny kindly introduced, my name is Brittany Davis um, and I've been involved, I started riding when I was six and I've dabbled in many, many disciplines um, across the equine industry through English, Western, polo racing. I've even tried vaulting. I've not tried driving yet, so if someone wants to teach me to drive a team of horses, you will make my day. <laughs> um, I also am involved in numerous boards and committees, um, both provincially and nationally. So in this presentation, we're going to be talking about um, a few different things, body condition scores, importance of different nutrients for the broodmare through preconception, early and late pregnancy, the last four weeks prepartum lactation, and then uh, Dr. Santa Rosa will be covering deworming vaccinations and dental at the end. We've got a well-rounded presentation for you guys today. Uh, I wanted to start with weight and body condition score because this really is important for mares to carefully, carefully monitor it from before they even conceive to help them have the best chances of conception right through their pregnancy and postpartum condition. Uh, good nutrition is essential for, for fertility, for foal development, and for lifelong performance of both your broodmare and your foal. Um, flushing is something that comes up a lot, and that's something that could be considered in maiden mares only. It's where you put them on um, an elevated plane of nutrition, but it's not my favorite technique. Um, what you want to do with your broodmares is avoid rapid weight gain or weight loss. So body condition score, um, you check key points in the neck, the shoulders, along the ribs, back, loin, croup, and hind quarters, and you're palpating the fatty deposits and bony landmarks to, see, to keep an eye on your mare's overall condition. So what you wanna aim for in the Henneke scale of one to nine is for around a five to a six for a brood mare. And we've got a good definition here of um, how it should feel if, you know, ribs are, you know, felt, but not seen. And um, you can find these graphs kind of all over the internet. So underfeeding your broodmare can result obviously in weight loss, but it also impacts your fertility. It reduces your foal growth and it actually increases your foal's risk of developmental orthopedic diseases. So these are all your leg issues. But the same thing can happen when you're overfeeding with a fat or obese more, a obese mare. Um, it actually costs more to have them overfed and fat as well. So you can save money by keeping them at that nice five to six range. Um, with overfeeding, you can get metabolic issues, 
insulin dysregulation, um, increased risk of colic, laminitis, and founder, and also for your full and increased risk of those developmental orthopedic diseases. Um, and as well with having underweight mares, that you're going to have a longer gestation, a longer interovulatory period, which is um, kind of in between ovulation cycles. That's going to be longer in mares that are underweight and struggling to maintain their nutritional needs. Um, it can take you more cycles to conceive. You can have loss of those conceptions. Um, so generally fertility and lower pregnancy or fertility issues and lower pregnancy uh, rates. You are, also, you are also going to have lower full birth weights and lower milk production, which impacts your foal's growth. And then on the other hand, with your overweight mares, um, they can have more difficulty foaling out. You can get more angular and flexural limb deformities, um, again, increased risk of laminitis, decreased insulin sensitivity. So this is where you can get into those insulin resistance issues. Um, decreased milk production, I, interestingly, is not something you would not normally think would be associated with overweight and overfeeding mares, but you do get decreased milk production in these overweight mares. And then decreased cholesterol IgG, so those are those important immune factors that are passed from mare to foal. You will actually have less of those passing in mares that are overweight. And then obesity, this poor mare here is probably a nine. Um, you, you are going to have, um, again, irregular cycles as well with your obese mares that are around an eight to nine on that Henneke scale. Um, changes in your follicles in the mare's ovaries, uh, reduced endometrial health in their uterus, lower milk production, and so forth. And they will have trouble conceiving after they've pulled out if they are in this condition. So there is a relationship between mare and full weight full um, body weight, body condition score, and daily gain is positively correlated to mare weight and body condition score, which means they are um, you know, heavier mares, heavier foals, and the same for the other way around. So faster growing foals are from mares that are actively gaining weight, which may seem like a good thing, but you will see on the next slide why that might not necessarily be a good thing. Um, and then high grain intake in mares can also result in a higher full birth weight. With those larger foals though, you do have, a, again, increased risk of foaling issues um, and increased risk of developmental orthopedic diseases and osteochondritis desiccans, um, increased conformational abnormalities. These are your flexural and angular limb deformities, um, increased conformational abnorm abnormalities, reduced fertility, smaller foals, they can take longer to stand and nurse, um, and some risk of DOD as well. So the foundation of nutrition is your hay. It's always going to be your hay or your forage, whatever, um, your hay or your pasture, whatever forage is available at that time of year. But do you actually know what's in your hay? Um, hay is affected by so many factors. And this year alone, I have seen hay tests all over the place because some people have gotten, um, in Alberta here, we have gotten three cuts, which is something that never happens typically. So what I've been seeing a lot of is either really, really high calcium or really, really low calcium. Um, typically for all hays in Alberta as well, we are very deficient in your sodium and your chloride, your salts. But I have seen hay tests all over the place, sugar levels all over the place. And really the only way to know what's in your hay is to have it tested. And similarly, you can actually do testing on your pasture to know what is in your pasture grass. Um, so some of the key nutrients that we should look at is uh, selenium is one of them that always is a hot one to come up. It's an antioxidant, uh, it's a mineral that's an antioxidant. It has roles in membrane integrity, in um, horse growth, in reproduction, and in immune system function. Deficiencies can cause white muscle disease, which is what this poor little guy has. Um, this foal did make a full recovery, thankfully, with intensive intervention. Um, you can also have difficulty suckling and so forth with a selenium deficiency. 
Um, selenium content really does vary by area. Usually here we are deficient, but you can check with local ag societies to see what the selenium levels in your area are. Um, selenium is added to a lot of feeds. So, but the selenium content in your feeds can vary widely. Some feeds don't include any, some have a lot. It's all a range in between, but keeping an eye on that is a good thing to know. Um, toxicity is very rare normally, but it can happen. So it is something to keep in the back of your mind as well. Um, and then there's been studies to show that selenium supplementation actually may increase those serum IgG concentrations, those um, kind of immune function um, antibodies in your foals, which are all good things. Um, vitamin E, anyone who has worked with me will know that I am a huge advocate of supplementing vitamin E in the winter. Your, high, um, your green grass in the summer has high amounts of vitamin E. You don't need to supplement at all if your horse is on green pasture. But in the winter, your hay can lose up to 75% of its vitamin E in the first three months of storage. This does depend on hay type. The range is about 67 to 75. So that's a lot. And vitamin E is an essential vitamin in a wide range of functions from muscle and nervous system, um, immune system. It's quite an essential one. So deficiencies can also contribute to white muscle disease, which we saw with the full above. And um, those white, white muscle diseases, there is an interplay between selenium and vitamin E that can contribute to that as well. A deficiency in vitamin E can also lead to equine degenerative myeloencephalopathy. Say that three times fast, um, but mostly in genetically prone horses and equine motor neuron disease. Now, brood mares need more vitamin E than your standard horse. So vitamin, for uh, vitamin E supplementation for mares, I do recommend around 1,600 IUs per day. Um, I do recommend, if possible, using natural vitamin E as that is better absorbed and has a higher bioavailability in horses. However, it is a higher cost. So if all you can work into your budget is synthetic vitamin E that is still better than not supplementing it in the winter. And once your mare's on grass pasture again, you can completely stop using it. Um, increased vitamin E at that 1600 IUs per day has been shown to increase those serum IgG levels in the mare, in the mare's colostrum and in your foals. So all around more improved immune system. Um, it also improves the passive transfer of that immunity to your foal when they drink that colostrum and may help in reducing some newborn foal diseases. Another vitamin here is vitamin A. Again, grasses have high levels of vitamin A. Now vitamin A is not as fragile as vitamin E, so it doesn't break down as fast in hay, but it still does break down to some degree. Vitamin A has a role in cell differentiation. So when your full is developing in utero, their cells are differentiating and going through a lot of change. And vitamin A plays a large role in the normal differentiation of those cells, in the gene expression within those cells, um, and in the immune responses of the mare and the full. Beta carotene is the form that you find in nature. It's called a provitamin. So it's beta carotene in your grasses that are then converted in the horse's body to vitamin A. And again, plenty in green grass. Um, most feed companies do have added vitamin A to their concentrate feeds. So usually you do not have to supplement extra on top if you have a good mare full feed that you are feeding and we will get into that here soon. Um, but oats, barley, your grains, they do have very poor amounts of vitamin A. Calcium and phosphorus. Uh, these are probably two of the, at least the nutritional basis suspects for a lot of those DOD problems. Um, nutrition is only one factor that can contribute to developmental orthopedic diseases and leg issues. It's not the sole cause, but it is um, nutritional imbalances are one of the other causes, are one of um, just one of the causes. There's other 
developmental things that can happen in utero that are not nutrition-based that can lead to this. But for this presentation, we're just focusing on the nutritional aspects of it. So calcium and phosphorus are both major components of the bone. Um, young horses are more sensitive to the calcium phosphorus ratio, and there is an important ratio that um, exists between these two minerals. Ideally, for foals, you want 2.6 to 1. So that's 2.6 parts calcium to one part phosphorus. <laughs> um, but foals cannot tolerate lower than 2.2 to 1. Adult horses can tolerate levels lower than 2.2, but young horses cannot without having um, issues. If that ratio is below 2.2, then your horse is at risk of having the calcium leached out of their bones to help, help run muscles in their body and um, to help run their heart because calcium does play a role in the heart contraction heartbeats. So then you start having issues with not um, improper bone development when they're leaching the calcium out of their bones to make up for a lack of it in other systems when they don't have enough in their diet. Um, grains have very high phosphorus and low calcium, so it's an inverse relationship. And grains can contribute to um, an imbalance between these nutrients and ultimately having um, higher risk of those developmental limb deformities osteochondrosis desiccans and other issues. So keeping calcium phosphorus ratio is, should be one of the main factors that you are considering when formulating a diet for your broodmares and for your foals. Um, as a rule of thumb, when it comes to haze, generally grass haze a little bit lower in calcium than alfalfa hay, but this year for Alberta at least, it has been wild and I have seen it all over the map. So it would be a good idea to um, test your hay. Copper and zinc are two other minerals that have an important ratio between them, um, typically with higher concentrations of zinc and, and lower concentrations of copper. There is a range, same as the calcium and phosphorus. Um, low copper is a bit more of an issue um, that you do see it does have those developmental orthopedic diseases, limb deformities. This little foal has a flexural limb deformity and the foal on the previous slide um, was an angular limb deformity. So low zinc, you tend to see more poor growth, poor appetite, and you can even see hair loss. Um, in your older mares, you're going to, so you can see a lower like serum, blood serum copper. So in your older brood mares, additional copper supplementation may be uh, required for those mares. Um, you have to also watch with too high zinc, as if it is too high, it will actually impact the copper absorption and then end up with low, and then you will end up with lower copper because your horse isn't able to absorb enough. Then omega-3 fatty acids are an interesting one that has had some recent research done. Um, <clears throat> Omega-3s have been linked to increasing ovulation rate, improving implantation, and reducing those early embryonic losses. Um, they can help with growth and blood flow in the placenta, which actually improves the nutritional supply to that developing fetus and helps encourage normal growth and development in that fetus. Um, also helps with the immune competence of the foal. Now, EPA and DHA, which are eicosapentaenoic acid and docosahexaenoic acid, um, are involved in a process that make prostaglandins, which among many functions in the body, they are involved in labor and birth of your foal. So they are two important ones, um, but the primary the primary source that you're going to see for those EPA and DHA is actually fish oil. It is the only natural source. Now, whether we should feed fish oil to horses and whether horses will even eat fish oil, that's a whole other discussion, but those are the only natural sources of um, those EPAs and DHAs. The kind of oil that you're, or the kind of omega-3 that you're going to see in your other oil types is actually your alpha linolenic oil or sorry, alpha-linolenic acid, which is um, a different type of omega-3 fatty acid. Um, oil is energy dense, so you don't need a lot. 
uh, a little will go a long way. Um, high levels, flaxseed and fish oil for your high omega-3s, um, but do avoid your corn oil, your sunflower oil, and your rice bran oil. They have almost no omega-3s and very high levels of omega-6 fatty acids, which, which have, um, they do play a role in the horse, but too much of them can cause some inflammatory responses in the horse's body. So um, all your other oils kind of fall in a scale in the middle. So feeding for conception. Feeding your broodmare for good conception and good foaling actually begins before breeding and it can start up to four months before you're planning on breeding. It gives you time to get your mare in a good body condition, make sure all the vitamins, minerals in her diet are balanced and her body has what it needs. Again, five to six uh, on the body condition score are best. So avoid that below four and above seven. You have an athletic mare that's currently actively competing. Um, they can be a little lower. Some of those elite eventing horses, your race horses, um, you're, you could be at a, like a 4.5 on the body condition score. So it might be wise to back off on the training a little bit and up the feed to help get her body condition in that five to six range so that you have your best chance of conception. Um, even if you are going to do something like an embryo transfer and not keep that mare pregnant, it is a good idea for the best set, uh, chances of success to increase her condition a little bit. So all you need at this point though is primarily a forage-based diet with maintenance level requirements. Um, and a vitamin mineral supplement or a ration balancer that complements your haze profile and fills in any gaps in it. Uh, a concentrate's not normally needed unless you have a really hard keeper or the mare is being actively ridden, then you might need to depending on what her uh, level of nutritional need at that point is. So early pregnancy, up to five months, um, you actually do not need a high amount of nutrition. It's barely above maintenance, barely above what you need or even at what you needed before you got her pregnant, which does surprise a lot of people. Um, at this point, still always forage-based and really just a vitamin mineral supplement or a ration balancer on top, odds are you don't need a concentrate or any grains. Um, if your mare is on grass, depending on what time of the year you are breeding, because I know that there's probably people from all over, your racehorses are already breeding. There's other people that aren't going to be pulling out until June or July and not breeding until the summer. So if your mare happens to be on grass at this point, um, do keep in mind the grass still needs to be, grass pasture still needs to be balanced for vitamins and minerals. Um, but yeah, if you can have your mare on grass, that is definitely better than hay. Um, concentrates, not typically not needed. Uh, do keep an eye on that body condition score. We don't want her gaining or losing any unnecessary weight. Um, and please resist the urge to overfeed. I know it's very tempting. I've been there with my mares. It's very, very tempting to start overfeeding at this point, but that can cause issues as we have seen um, previously. So from five months onward, um, the energy requirements actually don't increase as much as you see. And you can see here, this is percent of birth weight. Those first five months, your foal isn't even 10% of its final birth weight. That's why you don't need much above maintenance. In those first five months, if your foal is going to drop at 100 pounds, you're not even at 10 pounds yet. It's a very slow growth. It's after this point. And from about eight months onward is when two thirds of the growth of the foal happens is from eight months onward, and especially in these last uh, three months. So your energy needs are going to increase approximately 25% from early pregnancy. Um, and while that's energy needs, you know, cal caloric need, your needs for your protein and for your minerals increase exponentially. Um, you do need to keep those mineral ratios balanced still. And then the need for your trace minerals, like your copper, your zinc, your manganese, and your selenium, um, you really have to make sure the mare is getting uh, base levels of those. 
um, vitamin A is essential. So you may need to provide a ration balancer or a uh, mare in full concentrate that has vitamin A for your mare at this point. Um, especially towards the end here, uh, a lot of mares can start struggling to maintain on maintain weight on just a forage um, on on a forage and ration balancer or vitamin minerals supplement alone. So you might need to add a mare full concentrate. I'm not a big fan of adding grains at this point, as I previously mentioned with the calcium phosphorus ratio being out of whack. It can be very, very difficult to rebalance those out um, in a way that your foal is getting enough and not going to be at an increased risk of those developmental orthopedic diseases. Um, the exact amount of extra energy and extra feed that your mare needs is going to vary a lot depending on the breed, the age, if your mare is an easier hard keeper, and uh, the quality of your hay. There's a lot of factors that go into that. So again, getting your hay tested and knowing what it's in it. So then knowing you can know and figure out what your mare needs on top of it is the best way to go. Continue to monitor her body condition scores so that you that she doesn't gain any um, oh, too much weight or lose any weight at this point. It'll let me, there we go. And then prepartum in the four weeks up until your foal is born. Um, again, calcium phosphorus, especially at this point, if you can get as close to that 2.6 calcium to one part phosphorus as possible, that will definitely work in your foal's best interest. Some mares can get a little backed up at this point in time. Um, so adding some extra water, such as through beet pulp, could be beneficial. Um, my favorite way to do it is actually through watering down their regular diet. So if your mare is on a concentrated mare and full feed at this point, you can add some water to that and soften it up a little bit to kind of make it easier for your mare. Um, just with the size of the growing foal in this last you know, month until foaling, um, mares actually, it's getting a little crowded in her abdomen. It's, um, and they will act actually on their own stop uh, cut down their intake by 10 to 30 percent. And additionally, their ability to digest and absorb nutrients from the feed they're eating in this last little bit actually is reduced by about 5 percent. So between those two factors, you really have to stay on top of your quality of feed. You definitely want quality over quantity at this point. So your um, nutrient-dense, caloric-dense feeds, um, and make sure that she's getting enough protein. Um, do avoid fescue hay because it has been linked to uh, risk of, abor of abortions. Um, but your mare's actual weight is only going to increase by about 2% in the, this last little bit. And this mare is actually uh, my quarter horse and the poor girl, I thought she was going to pop at any point and she ended up going 10 more days after this picture was taken. So at this point, now it's just waiting for your foal to be born, sleepless nights, and some, no doubt, a lot of impatience. Or, you know, this little guy's also mine and they can surprise you and come early like this guy did. <laughs> um, now that your foal's on the ground, congratulations. Hopefully everything went smoothly with no issues. Now is not the time to ease up on your mare's nutrition. In fact, your mare's requirements for lactation for nursing have just doubled. Your energy, your protein, lysine, calcium have doubled actually and certain minerals like your calcium and phosphorus will go up by more than 75%. So where I've previously been saying, don't overfeed, don't overfeed, I'm telling you the opposite now, do not underfeed your mare. She needs a huge amount of nutrients to provide milk for that growing adorable foal of yours. Um, lots and lots and lots of hay, uh, pasture grass if it's available at the time of year that you're foaling out, if you can. Um, again, keep those forages balanced for vitamin minerals. Your mare at this point is likely going to need some sort of concentrate feed to make up for all of the energy needs and the protein needs that she is going to have. Um, especially the protein, quality protein, 
not just lysine, which is a limiting amino acid, but there are other amino acids such as methionine, arginine, um, valine, and uh, leucine, that, as well as a few others that are really essential um, amino acids that do need to be provided in good quality, easily to digest, uh, easily digestible feeds. Furthermore, with lactation, um, your milk yield from your mare and the nutrients in that milk is actually going to increase for the first three months. So for those first three months, you're going to have to continue increasing the amount that your mare needs. Um, at the peak around the two to three month point, your mare is going to be, be producing 10 to 18 liters of milk per day. Of course, this does depend on breeds. If you've got a Shire or a little Shetland, you're gonna be outside that range but 10 to 18 liters, that is two and a half to four and a half of those four liter milk jugs. That's a huge amount. Um, after three months, your milk production does start to gradually reduce and the nutrients in the milk do start to go down, but they are still above that birth point until your six to eight month point around there, um, which is typically when most people end up weaning the foal and they're usually, you know, nibbling on grass at that point. Um, now, if you are rebreeding while your mare is nursing, you, she may need extra energy, especially if you've rebred your foals, you know, five or six months old is still nursing. But at that point, your mare needs uh, nutritional needs around five, six months are going to start increasing. You do have to keep that in mind um, if you're both nursing and re and your mare is pregnant again. Uh, hang on, let me get my, oh, yep. Hang on, let me get my laser pointer, there we go. So this is just one example diet. Do not take these as hard and fast numbers for all horses, because this was, uh, these are just example numbers for one very specific weight and breed of horse. These numbers are going to vary a lot depending on your horse's um, breed and age, size, nutrition, basal level, nutritional needs, again, that easy or hard keeper. But I did want to emphasize the amount that their requirements actually increase. This is for your energy. So you can see just an open, unbred mare. Um, the first five months of gestation, kind of the same. And you can see how it increases to that first month of lactation, where you're almost double the energy requirements of that, of, of when they're open, not pregnant. Uh, similarly for protein, you're more than double their uh, nutritional protein requirements by that first month of lactation. And then you can see how it does gradually reduce. Um, just another way of showing uh, where at your foaling here, how much the energy protein, one and a half, nearly two times the requirements your protein levels over 2.2 times their addition, their basal metabolic needs, so their maintenance amount if they weren't pregnant, and things like your calcium phosphorus are nearly three times the amount that they would need if they weren't pregnant and weren't nursing, and then it does drop off again. Um, and I will pass it over to Dr. Santa Rosa. Okay, I'm coming back on. I like to mute myself, especially because my puppy is in the room. Um, Penny just texted me and I wonder, I just have two short little slides, but we do have a number of questions, Brittany. Do you want to just take questions at the end or do you want to do it now? Do you um, have a No, we can do them now or we can take them at the end. Okay, well, maybe I'll just... Uh, complete this. We just wanted to yeah. add, uh, kind of bookend here on a presentation that let me be the first to say I was taking notes. Um, <laughs> this is why I like to have you on our team, right? And, you know, the language, the dietitian, you know, really speaks through. So fantastic. And uh, truly just to bookend the presentation, we want to offer you uh, some vaccination deworming recommendations uh, from Delaney. So just it'll depend a little bit on timing. So subjectively, the months uh, there on the left, but about a month prior to foaling, uh, you want to do 
your booster, your Eastern, Western, Tetanus, West Nile, Flu, Rhino about a month before polling. Um, we try to make most of our recommendations now for deworming based on a fecal flotation. Uh, and to not go too far down that rabbit hole, you can email us. Uh, we did an entire talk about parasites um, and deworming protocols and approaches. So I think that that is, you know, really the, the, the crux of what we're saying now is to make educated decisions based on a fecal flotation first. Um, come April and May, uh, we don't want to, when you're rebreeding a mare, we don't want to deworm between one and 60 days. Um, after 60 days, we can consider deworming again, ideally based on a fecal float. Um, come June and September, now these are our bred mares who are going to be expecting in the spring, we want to use that quote unquote abortion vaccine, that pneumobort rhino. Um, and that's a very specific vaccine, of course, that we have to administer at five, seven and nine months uh, for it to be effective. Um, at this time, again, we may deworm again based on a fecal float. Now, for most of our horses going into fall, even if they haven't required a chemical dewormer uh, throughout the summer months, typically we do deworm in the fall. And so because of that, we're going to consider our fecal float after we deworm, simply to determine the efficacy of the deworming and as a way to kind of surveillance for resistance in our population. It's the, the emerging responsibility. Uh, next slide, Brittany. And uh, dentistry recommendations. Um, if you were able to attend our uh, last months, last weeks, however long ago, our last webinar was about dentistry and its effects on the stomatognathic system, which perhaps impact uh, Mare's ability to deliver a foal through her pelvic floor because we know jaw tension affects pelvic tension. So um, dentistry recommendations, certainly um, we tend to assess those based on the vaccination deworming exams. We don't recommend uh, floating while pregnant. So we prefer to float within one to two weeks of foaling if you're rebreeding. If you're not rebreeding, then there's really no urgency to it. Um, for any of these basic protocols or recommendations, please uh, give them a shout at uh, the repro department. And I think one of our repro representatives might be with us tonight, but you can always email repro at delaneyvetservices.com or call our main office for information. Um, if you're interested in any of those previous webinars I referred to about specific deworming uh, or dentistry talks, please email penny at rehab at delaneyvetservices.com and you can request the link for our YouTube page. And I will answer one question right now, which is, that's where this talk will be after we're done. There you go, Penny, one question off the list. And back to Brittany and Penny, and thanks so much for joining. I thought I would just pop up a slide with all the references that I have um, used to compile this presentation. If anyone is interested, I'm sure people will be pausing this on the YouTube link afterwards. And um, my contact info and where to find me on social media and my website and how to email me. And I will, where's the thing where I can see questions? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to read the questions to you, I think, if you're okay with that. So, oh, wow, yeah, we do have a lot. I see them. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is regarding hay, is there any concern with farmers using inoculant? I'm assuming that's I, I'm not much of a hay maker, so I actually don't know what that is. Um, we land lease out and my neighbor does all my hay. So I'm not, as for growing hay, I'm not actually sir, uh, sure. I can look it up if you want to email me and I can try and find out. But uh, yeah, I apologize. I'm not actually sure. That is fair. Um... To see here. What do you suggest as products to help with the selenium and vitamin E in broodmares specifically? Um, well, it, it does depend. So the vitamin E, uh, as I had mentioned on that slide, a natural source of vitamin E, if, uh, if your budget allows, if you're feeding, you know, like eight broodmares, that might get a bit pricey, um, especially at the 1600 I use. So you may have to end up using synthetic vitamin E. I'm not picky for brands. Um, I specifically, most are pretty decent. I do know that the Kentucky Equine Research one, uh, especially their natural vitamin E is really good, but that is not cheap. 
I will tell you right now that it's not cheap. So um, as for selenium, that's also going, supplementing that is going to depend on what else you're giving your mare. If the vitamin mineral supplement that you're using to fill in the other, you know, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium needs of your horse does also contain selenium in it and in how much. So there is no hard and fast answer to that as a product. Sorry. Okay. okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, let's see. Will this presentation be made, made made available after the webinar? Yes, I am recording it. So as soon as I it down uploads onto our cloud and I have time to download it onto our YouTube site, I will do that and we'll post that on Facebook so everybody can um, watch it again and take notes. Um, this one might be for you, Jody. Julie, hi, Julie. Um, is hemp protein a good supplement for brood mares? You're you're muted. <laughs> maybe that was that was maybe you know that was Brittany was supposed to answer. I'll I'll chime in two cents and then I'm happy to have Brittany. It was like yeah, uh, I I like hemp protein in general, as you know, Penny. Um, it's a good support in terms of the absorbability. It's highly, highly digestible. Um, it has all the essential amino acids. And my only caveat to it, my only caution with really any protein or sorry, any omega-3 fat, and there will still be a little bit of the fat even in a protein fiber, is that it can reduce the stickiness of platelets. And so, and I don't know, Brittany, if this is something, it's kind of interesting in here because I generally advise clients take off any fat products about a month before folding, just because it can make bleeding worse. So that's my question. Or yes, my I'd, for, I'd forgotten to mention that on my omega-3 slide and on my four months um, pre-folding was, yes, uh, thank you for reminding me to um, kind of eliminate those fats that last month before pulling for the reasons Jody mentioned. But as for hemp protein in general, yes, it uh, does have good digestibility and it does have a good balance of those essential amino acids in it. So it can be good for broodmares. Next. Okay, I don't know who's gonna answer this one. Jordan has asked, uh, what is the percentage of fetal loss once a heartbeat is confirmed at approximately 45 days? I think, I think Leah's on here. Does Leah know the answer to that? Leah is here, maybe she Sorry, does. that's not my area. <laughs> <laughs> Leah is on. <laughs> I think that's a Lana question, seeing as she's the one normally yeah. doing those. If whoever asked that can give us some uh, way to contact you between Leah and I, uh, we could actually offer a, a response to that. Yeah, just maybe just email the repro at Delaney Vet Services uh, email and we'll, we'll get an answer for you. Um, and the natural source of vitamin E that you suggested, she said Kentucky something, I think that's Kentucky Research. Uh, Kentucky Nano Equine Research, they have the Elevate uh, yeah. E. Just if your mare, um, hopefully you're not breeding a mare that has a metabolic issue, but if your mare is a little more towards that kind of easy keeper IR body type, there is sugar in that one. So for mares that are, or for horses in general, um, they do have a liquid form that doesn't have sugar, or you can look at other brands that do not have sugar in them. Um, that's my only caveat with their powdered natural vitamin E is there is sugar in it. But I mean, one scoop isn't going to hurt for most um, for horses with a normal immune fun or normal metabolic function. Okay. Uh, Nancy wants to know where does Camelina oil supplement fit in as far as omega oils are concerned. I think you touched on that, but if you could just uh, I think I missed them, uh, Camelina. I do believe it is um, moderate omega threes. I don't know exactly how much off the top of my head, but I do know it does have um, a de at least a decent amount of omega three in it. I'm gonna... Okay, good. I think um, there was above that. Uh, Molly, oh, yeah. <laughs> had it named uh, the well-rounded oh, well mineral that I suggest. Again, that's going to depend on what's in your hay. Uh, when I formulate diets for clients, I rarely ever use the same 
vitamin mineral supplement to clients in a row just because the hay, hay tests that I am getting or the type of hay they're feeding or their horse's needs are just all so different and all over the place. There isn't any one brand that I stick to. Okay. So call Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much is too much in selenium? Someone told me they give their full oral selenium after birth. Is that okay or not? That's a tough one. Um, I do, how much of that is actually absorbed by the full? I'm not sure. Um, the research on that one is spotty. You have studies saying that yes, it helps. And I've seen other studies say that no, it doesn't help any. Um, and I think the issue with that is, is a lot of those studies don't elaborate further on the selenium content of the horse's diet up until that point. So there isn't really a solid science answer um, as to whether giving that up after birth is a good idea or not. You will have to check with your vet. They might have a good idea. Okay, we have a question on the inoculant. <clears throat> so I don't know your name, but it just says iPhone. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> inoculant is a microbial preservative to help avoid hay molding if there's too much moisture. So that was the question. I think the first question about inoculant and the hay you may still not know the answer. I don't know. But... Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I still, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I do the molding and mycotoxins in your hay are definitely a health hazard for the horse. Um, I'm just not sure what all is in the inoculant um, to help kind of preserve and what types of microbiota are in those. So that is something I would maybe have to look into and then can go from there. But I will understand it if I do read it because my undergrad focus was actually biomedical sciences. So I did do a lot with um, microbiology and biochemistry. Okay, um, so Nancy says, so no deworming on the day of foaling. Not the current protocol put forth by the repro department. Leah, do you have anything to add to that? If Leah is still here. Maybe she went to do chores. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the pro yeah. protocol that we follow, she says. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more question here. I had a mare, uh, uh, let's see, I had a mare last breeding season who was losing top line in spite of feeding quite a lot. And then she had a huge foal with a little trouble foaling. Once she folds, she put the weight back on quickly. Is there a certain feed that can help keep the mare condition in good shape, but not risk too much growth in the foal? Um, again, that specific products are really tough for me to recommend without knowing what uh, your hay mix is and kind of what is in that. So certain feeds, um, just you want to look, what, were you on a mare and foal feed specifically, or were you on a different concentrate? Because uh, you can look into those mare and foals. You could also consider something like a, adding a bit of a senior feed in there. In general, uh, senior feeds are a little bit more digestible, which can help if, especially in that end line where they are decreasing their amount of voluntary intake, having a higher um, and easier to digest feed can help with your mare's weight. So that was my question. And I, I wasn't asking for a brand necessarily. I, I was asking more about a category. So uh, the mayor had been losing top line. She was on a, um, I feed Neutrina safe choice, Marin full. So she was on that. She was on grain. She was on beet pulp and cubes and she was on hay. And so I was concerned because she was losing weight, but then I had a monster full. And so my, my question was more, should I try to increase the mare, the, the mare and full safe choice feed or increase hay or increase the beet pulp and cubes? Is there one area that I should focus on to try to not grow this monster of a foal, um, but also keep my mare in good condition? Or should I just assume that it may be that the mare gives to her foal and that decrease in body condition is something that based on an individual might happen? Yeah, that's a bit of a tough one. Um, you can try increasing the mare and foal and the hay definitely always increase the hay, but 
especially with how fast that fool sounds like it was growing, that might be a bit of a fine line and she just might be one of those mares that ends up losing a little bit towards the end. Um, you definitely want to try and avoid those over large foals because of foaling issues and you don't want to end up having to get a c-section done. <laughs> so um, that's yeah I, I'm sorry I don't have a clear answer it's a tough one. Okay, okay. We, hopefully that answered as much of that question as you can. Um, Nicole would like uh, comments that she has an older maiden mare. She's 15. She gained weight at five months and then steadily grew to, uh, to nine and then stayed the same. Then she lost weight at 10 months. Um, and should she feed her more or stick to the same? Yeah, so with that increased full growth towards that 10, 11, 12, or 10, 11 months, you do need to continually gradually you don't want to like drastically jump but you do want a kind of gradual increase in nutrition what until they're approaching that um i'm oh, sorry we might get uh, a guest cameo with my cat here um, <laughs> you want to um kind of gradually increase and all diet changes with mares i um i should say make them gradually, don't just rapidly change and go, okay, they're five months, we're increasing 25%, no, no. Make it gradual, you wanna make any diet change with your horse over seven to 14 days at least, and preferably take as long as 21 days to make mm -hmm. that diet change. Um, when you're introducing new supplements, new feeds, you want to take your time introducing them so you can allow the uh, microbial biome in your horse's gut to really um, kind of adapt slowly and not cause digestive upset or kind of shock the horse's microbiome in their intestines, if that makes sense, just gradual. Okay. Uh, Tamara says she has an older mare that recently started losing weight. She's due to full in May, June. We suspect she's having issues with her teeth. Would you recommend we not float her teeth? I guess that's a Jody. That would be a Jody. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so Tamara has an older mare that recently started to lose weight. She's due to full in May or June, and she suspects that she's having issues with her teeth. And would you recommend floating or not floating while yeah. she's pregnant? That must have gone to you personally, because I'm reading the questions and I didn't see that one. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, you know, I think in everything, Tamara, there's always a risk and a benefit. And I think that always and never, you know, are things we try to avoid. So I think it's an individual thing. And sometimes what we do is we do a physical exam. We can, you know, kind of sweet talk the horses sometimes, pop the gag in there, see what's going on. And is the problem in the mouth? And if the problem is in the mouth and we say, then what are the risks of sedating this horse and doing, you know, this dental procedure and what are the benefits? And, you know, we, we make a decision and we try to mitigate risks we can. Um, but in the end, if she's going to be suffering, if she develops an infection, if she's losing weight, unable to, you know, consume enough calories for her own well-being, um, you know, it might be something we decide to move forward with. I'd say it's an individual thing. Okay. Um, and Julie wants to know any insight on the use of probiotics and prebiotics for brood mares and foals. They can be beneficial. Um, there is some debate on how much actually gets into the horse's gut because the stomach acid does destroy a fair amount of it. So if you can kind of make sure that's fed with a lot of really fibrous feeds, um, kind of feet pulp or so, you know, wetted down hay or something so that those, um, especially for your probiotics so that they have somewhere they can hide and hopefully survive the stomach acid, that is beneficial. Um, they're not going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted there, Penny. <laughs> I just noticed that it just it just flashed to me you're muted uh okay so uh lillian would, would like to know where she can get her hay tested um i do know that you guys do that i get plenty of hay test results <laughs> from you guys um there's a number of labs around alberta 
you do have to watch that some of them test more for cows. So the results that you get back are really printed, um, really tested for and printed out for cows. And there's not a lot of that that's actually applicable to horses. So those ones can be a waste of money. Um, Equianalytical in the US probably does some of the best equine specific testing. I know um, Neutralytical in Calgary do, does send off to them. Uh, there's also a couple companies in Ontario that seem to do some pretty good testing, but you might wanna shop around and make sure it is actually truly more specific for horses and not just a cow one sort of used for horse testing too. Okay. okay. And just to clarify, we have a hay core sampler at Delaney that anyone is allowed to sign out and borrow and bring samples back and we will send them out for you if, if that's what you'd like us to do. Yeah. Uh, Those are the best way instead of doing grab samples. And we did actually do a hay talk that they can probably get the video from you guys for. Sure. There, yeah. Was there that one? It's <laughs> called one Hay. So anybody who's interested in that, just email me and I will send you the link. Uh, you Jordan, says, or, yeah. oh, yes. Sorry. Nope, go. <laughs> uh, Jordan says, sorry, I keep thinking we're at the bottom of the questions and then they just keep coming. <laughs> you guys are so fascinating. Um, there seems to be a trend in the amino acid spirulina for body condition. Is this something you would recommend or not recommend for an aged broodmare that you're trying to keep top line and condition on? Spirulina, um, some... <laughs> It, a lot of it has to do with dose. I mean, a couple tablespoons of spirulina or something, you're really not getting all that much out of it for amino acids. Um, and then too high of it, some horses don't like that kind of salty, um, salty kind of oceany taste, and then it does turn them off their feed. So I would say that maybe um, kind of a more palatable feed, um, well-rounded, feed, uh, protein feed that you could use instead that it, just in a larger amount, because really the amount of spirulina you're going to feed versus the amount of protein they're actually getting out of it, it's minuscule, especially compared to, you know, for my one example horse, it was what, nearly 1600, uh, 1600 grams there. So yeah, it's when you're feeding a couple, tea, you know, ta a tablespoon or two, it's, a drop of water in the bucket. Okay. okay. If it makes you feel good, throw a teaspoon. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it won't hurt, <laughs> but your horse isn't getting out um, as much out of it as you hope and would like. Perfect. In reality. Okay. Uh, okay. For hard keeper mares producing large foals, would it be best to have them above the five to, five to six body condition? Uh, before the eight month mark in anticipation for them potentially going through weight loss despite feeding to maintain condition? Or do you just try to keep up, which can be a little difficult to do post foaling? Yeah, it might not be a bad idea um, to aim kind of for a six, could push it to like a six and a half, but do you try to avoid um, putting your mare at, oops, sorry, my cat is now. <laughs> putting them at a, like a seven, eight in body condition and risking obesity because of even at that kind of seven, eight body condition score, you can get um, mineral imbalances and you can increase your risk of them, even if they do drop the weight of them potentially having a mild um, developmental orthopedic disease. So you could probably push it to six and a half to give yourself a little bit of buffer room there, but I wouldn't go above a seven. Okay. Um, <laughs> looks like Jordan just just um, clarified here, the spirulina um, just oh, the is more that it's dense in omega-3s and fairly dense with other amino acids. So is it generally a good supplement? But I, I think we've answered the question, hopefully. Um, so yes, but in proper quantities is sort of what I'm hearing. Yeah. Potentially. Um, okay. And Kristen wants to know, she feeds a small amount of whole black oil sunflower seeds. Is this a concern for brood and mare nutrition? Um, just that last month with the fats in the black oil sunflower seeds, um, but a little bit of them is 
completely fine. You just maybe want to watch the oil level in that kind of last uh, prepartum four month or four week kind of period before folding. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and then what is preferable, whole flax or milled flax? Uh, definitely go with the ground flax. Whole flax is not digested as well. You want to kind of, yeah, ground flax. And I think what might, might be our last question. Uh, Nicole would like to know, is there a way to use a weight tape to get a good estimate weight on a pregnant mare? The numbers I'm getting, I just can't believe. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Um, so this is a good one and I forgot to mention um, how to kind of get weights on mares at the beginning. Um, it was on my mental to-do list and I forgot. So I'm, thank you, Nicole, for asking this question. Weight tapes can be up to 200 pounds inaccurate which is a surprising one. I like, I do prefer body measurements because unless you're one of the very few people in the world that actually have a horse scale and can actually fully weigh your mare, um, most of us can't do that. So I do like the body measurement one where you go point of shoulder to um, point of buttocks and then all the way around the heart girth. And there's a formula um, for it to calculate out how many pounds or kilograms to your mare weighs. Those are a little more, those are more accurate than a weight tape, but especially for those heavily pregnant mares, they're not, they start to lose accuracy. They can be about up to 30% off just with the size of that foal in that belly. It, they're not able to take account for that. So okay. that's why the body condition yeah. scoring and palpating yeah, yeah. those fat areas and palpating those bony markers is the better way to monitor your horse's weight. And condition. Excellent. I was just going to ask you that. That, that makes sense to me. Do body condition is great. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. We've had a couple uh, added here. Sorry for fat. Um, Becca would like to know for fat in the last month, do you pull it early in case they fall early or take it out a month early is sufficient even if a full is say 10 days before her due date? Um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't want to cut it just hard you can actually start tapering down on the oil starting even at like the six weeks to pre foaling point and just start gradually reducing it because that will give you at least a two-week buffer for your mare's uh, body to adapt to that change so that kind of will help a little bit with the buffer as for the risk of um, increased bleeding that is something that Jody might have to answer yeah for me I usually just I say a month before, but I mean, we, if, if your horse needs to have colic surgery and it got hemp oil that morning, we're still going to do the colic surgery. And so I, I think we just have to, you know, measure those risks. And if it's not a maiden mare, sometimes we know she's going to carry 345 or she's going to carry 338 or, you know, in that vicinity. And sometimes we just have to pivot to what they throw at us. So I say a month and realistically, like I had an experience myself with hemp oil where I developed bruising for a little bit, a dose was too high. Um, and it took about two weeks in me for it to wash out. So I say a month is a general recommendation and you do the best you can. Uh, okay, awesome. Thank you, Jody. Um, Nicole would like to know, she says she's been feeding cocoa soya. Should I stop it in the last month? I don't know what that is. It's just another type of um, basically oil, uh, same deal for all of the oils. And I did see the one further down asking about the ground flax as a fat, um, same thing for the ground flax, yes. Okay, excellent. I did see someone had their hand up. It might've been Carol at the bottom here. If you had your hand up, would you please unmute yourself and just ask a question? <laughs> I don't know if you can do that. Oh, there, Carol. Whoops. Oh, sorry, I muted you. I apologize. Uh oh, she's chatting. I can see her. Uh, I can't unmute you for some reason. Carol, can you unmute yourself again? I apologize. Unmute. There you are. Yay. There I am. <laughs> no, it was just. 
excuse me, it was just a, a thank you, a great presentation. And uh, thank you, Brittany. And thank you to Jody for putting me on last minute because I uh, had phoned the office to get an invitation and I didn't get it. So I had to call on others. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thanks for tuning in, Carol. We appreciate it. We always love seeing your smiling face. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you, Carol. Thanks, Brittany. <laughs> I'm I'm muting now. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right, I think we finally made it to the end of the question period. Uh, if anyone has any riveting questions that they've forgotten about, uh, just email me at the rehab at delaneyvetservices.com email address and I will forward it to whoever I think can answer it best for you. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for these presentations and um, we thank Brittany for taking the time out of her busy schedule. We know it's busy because we keep sending her <laughs> nutritional consults. Um, and um, yeah, we just really appreciate you joining us and sharing your knowledge and, and Jody, as always, we, we love your, your input. Um, I'm privileged to share an office with you so that, so I get to see every day, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I guess we probably need to just let you know that there, we do have more webinars coming up. Um, I should know what that is cause I send the invitations out, but the next one is, next uh, one. does every cough mean something? So that's on Wednesday, March 24th at 7 PM as well. Um, so you can, we'll be posting that on Facebook as well. So if you're interested, just uh, send me the email and I will, I will really try hard to get you the link. I, I don't know how I missed some people today, but, um, that's, that's the next one. Any parting words, Jody? No, it was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much everyone and have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Good night. all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Goodbye everyone.